unlike the other time when we had some difficulties with the technology. And I would like to start our uh, today's webinar with just quick reflection on it. We experimented with interplay with between video and uh, chat and two recordings. And one lesson learned is that innovation should be gradual, it should be incremental, and uh, we shouldn't rush with the technology. Technology is very often tempting, as you will see through our discussion on the ancient uh, world diplomacy, and that interplay between uh, patience and innovation is important for moving things forward. Today, on, uh, during our second webinar, we'll focus uh, on uh, ancient diplomacy. And uh, last week, we tried to trace the start of the beginnings, early beginnings of diplomacy. And uh, if you can recall, we identified that there are some elements of diplomacy, some proto-diplomacy, even in the animal world through those experiments uh, where uh, there were signs of uh, empathy and, uh, and compromise in uh, experiments done with a few few monkeys with the food, if you, if you watch the video later on. Therefore, we are now moving uh, through the uh, evolution of diplomacy and technology through the period of the uh, fifth uh, millennium BC and the probably dividing line, which we cannot trace back uh, uh, with the high precision, is emergence of writing. And sometimes the previous period that we discussed in January is uh, uh, considered to be pre-literate period. And uh, the second period of the mainly called ancient uh, world or ancient Near East is considered to be a literate period. And the dividing moment was invention of the writing, sometimes in the fourth century in the Sumerian kingdom, in nowadays Iraq or Mesopotamia. Therefore, that's the start of, uh, of this period. And what we're going to do we will first uh, uh, try, as the famous Churchill uh, tweet or slogan for our webinar says, we'll try to look uh, further backwards uh, toward the fourth millennium BC, almost 4,000 uh, years before Christ, uh, in order to uh, see better our time and try to uh, look into the future and uh, indicate what we can expect in the future time. Therefore, in the first step, we will move gradually through the through the uh, this long period of the almost five uh, millennium, and then we will draw the conclusions about the lessons about uh, our time, what we can, how we can anchor our current discussion on e-diplomacy in the lessons that could be drawn from the this uh, this uh, longer historical sway. So we will. Uh, start with uh, our underlying message of continuity and change and our friend who is trying still to light the fire and uh, his motivation for uh, good knowledge measuring and some sort of early perception of the time. And this is, as you can recall from our introductory session, the underlying message of our uh, webinars, continuity and change, tradition and innovation as uh, uh, is the title of uh, Stefano Baldi's presentation and as one of the next uh, TED uh, talks. Stefano, welcome to our uh, webinar. Uh, now, before we start, we, we should uh, we uh, uh, conceive and perceive world uh, through, uh, through geography and time, through space and time, and let us see what we are going to discuss. Where is this uh, period and development located? Fortunately, it is relatively more geographical space called the fertile crescent, the space or the area where the most of the ancient Near East uh, civilizations uh, appeared and developed. And uh, it goes, as you can see, from the uh, Mesopotamia, where the civilizations were developed around the rivers Tigris and the Euphrates, up to Nile, uh, where famous Egyptian old civilization was developed. There are many uh, discussions why the ancient civilizations uh, developed there. Now we have to keep in mind that uh, we had in parallel civilization in Central America, in uh, China and India. But uh, in a way, the current era, modern era, the uh, foundations of the modern era, including monotheistic religions, were developed uh, in the Fertile Crescent. One of the most fascinating books explaining why it happened 
uh, in this area is Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, written by Dreher the Diamond. I will send you the link, follow up, don't try to read it, probably it's not, uh, it's not completely clear, and link to his latest speech at the Royal Society Academy in London, trying to link uh, ancient time and uh, our modern time, attempt that we have been trying to do in our webinar. And good news is that there are more and more writings, reflections, where uh, authors and journalists are trying to bridge uh, this uh, old uh, uh, previous time and what we're doing now, including one interesting article in today's International Herald. You will receive a link also in the follow-up. So we have that region from the Mesopotamia, from the uh, Tigris and U Euphrates, by nowadays uh, Syria, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, uh, Israel, up to, up to Egypt. Now, this is the answer where we, where is it located? When, as uh, I already mentioned, it is a long, long period starting with invention and writing in Sumeria in the fourth uh, millennium BC. Then the main development of interest for us, of course, the timeline is more detailed, but main developments for, of interest for our discussion on diplomacy and technology uh, uh, happened in uh, Babylon, Amarna, Talamarna uh, uh, diplomacy, Hittites, Assyria, and Persia, in a way with, uh, with uh, Alexander the Great and the end of the Persia under the Darius, uh, it is uh, considered to be the end of the ancient Near East uh, civilization, which are the focus of our discussion today. And uh, ancient Greece took over as the sort of hub of the, of the international system at that time, we can call it that way. We'll go quickly through the, the major, this main uh, civilization, starting with uh, Mesopotamia, with the uh, Sumerian uh, civilization. civilization. I, uh, I don't know about you, but I still remember difficult time I had to memorize the name of the Lagash Ur Uruk from my early studies in secondary and the uh, school of the history of the ancient uh, Near East. This is the place where the first finding of the uh, writing documents developed. The main explanation uh, why the first civilizations, the organized societies developed in this field is related to the need to provide uh, um, uh, irrigation for the, for the agriculture. And that, in that area, the, the nomads coming from the north mainly settled and, and uh, established the more permanent um, cities around Ur, especially in Uruk and developed uh, early organization of society, including the first form of the proto-state and diplomacy. Now, this is the first text, uh, which is fine from the uh, fourth century BC, Sumerian inscription. I don't know if there is anyone who studied the ancient Near East and who can translate uh, at least some of them. They're a pictorial, but in a way it's not difficult to, to translate because they are, they are self-explanatory. And as you know, in the evolution of the writing, later on, uh, writing moved to the syllabus and the expression of the more uh, abstract, uh, abstract concept. Uh, the most important development in the, in the Mesopotamia era came uh, two, billion, uh, two uh, millennium later in the uh, second millennium in the 17th century BC with the Hammurabi's uh, civilization. He was the ruler of the, the Babylon. And uh, I'm sure that you are familiar with the code of Koma Hammurabi, one of the most uh, famous uh, version of the code of Hammurabi can, could be found in, uh, in, the, in Louvre in Paris. And it's, I think, photo is from Paris. And he, uh, it is amazing uh, how far reaching uh, a legal rules he established, some of the uh, famous uh, principle of the Talion, which was yet later on copied by many civilizations, and used, I would say, quite a lot even nowadays, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And uh, on this uh, sculpture, you can find quite a few uh, legal principles that you can recognize even today in our, uh, in our uh, legal system. The Code of Hammurabi was important, Hammurabi civilization was important for diplomacy. He had quite extensive uh, exchange with the uh, neighbors of the Babylon uh, at that uh, time. Now we move uh, uh, 
further further down now when when I say few books, we are speaking about centuries or even thousands, uh, hundreds and thousands of, of years. We are now moving to the fourth and fourteenth century, and uh, Amarna diplomacy, Tal Amarna diplomacy, this is a very interesting period in the history of Egypt. It's the Middle Kingdom uh, uh, in the history of Egypt, and it is interesting because for the first time, one ruler, uh, Akhenaton, starting with his father, they are called Amenhotep III and IV, or uh, more uh, famous Akhenaton, and we will recall also his wife, the name of his wife, Nefertiti, and his son, uh, his son Kamon. Therefore, a lot of, of our understanding of the Egyptian history come, uh, comes from this period of uh, Amarna diplomacy. Amor, uh, Akhenaton moved basically the capital from the Thebes, from nowadays the Luxor, to Amarna, to Amarna and build a new, new capital. But what was the most important, he uh, uh, challenged the rule of the, of the existing Egyptian uh, religion and the uh, and position of the priests in the society, uh, which were basically rulers behind the scenes. Therefore, he moved uh, the capital to Amarna, even to disassociate himself from the, from the Thebes and the, from Luxor, which remains nowadays for some uh, rulers who are trying also with the moving of the capital to start to initiate new era, to worship the sun, and uh, uh, the new, in a way, international society developed around uh, Amarna, with the uh, other players, mainly from the north, Mithai, Kanaim, and uh, other uh, major powers, which had uh, some sort of balance of power uh, system, uh, which helped the flourishing of the diplomacy. As you will see, and this is another underlying message, the more balance of power, the more players you have, the more diplomacy is important. As soon as there is a, a hegemonic power, it is um, in a way uh, suffocates the diplomacy need for the uh, negotiation. Uh, a priest obviously didn't uh, forget his uh, challenge, and uh, his son, uh, Tutankhamun, uh, made uh, one of the uh, most comprehensive early censorship exercises. The name of the Akhenaton, Amenhotep the Fourth, and to some extent Nefertiti, was removed from all palaces and inscriptions in the, in the ancient Egypt. Uh, they had a quite, quite a demanding work to erase from the collective memory uh, the name of the Amenhotep. Fortunately, uh, we have the link and we learned a lot from uh, about the Amarna diplomacy to Amarna letters, which were discovered at the end of the 19th century. Uh, there were about 350 Amarna letters, tablets, as you can see, with inscriptions, and most of them were related to a diplomacy. It was the first diplomatic archive, if you can call it that way, uh, containing really rich source of information about the way how diplomacy was performed in that period. You can find uh, some sort of uh, uh, all elements of nowadays diplomacy, curiosity, salutations, politeness, reciprocity. One of the most fascinating exchange was where two kings were exchanging uh, their gratitude, uh, one indicating that uh, he loved the other uh, 10 times more, 11 times more, and continuing in this way. But apart from that uh, trappings of diplomacy, which exist nowadays, even in our functional time, it is very functional, uh, it is very solid source from which we can uh, learn a lot about the way how international relations were conducted in that, way, in that period. It uh, inspired uh, Professor Raymond Cohen to organize uh, a conference in, uh, in Italy, I think in Bologna, on a modern diplomacy, and this book is a result of this conference. He argued quite strongly that it was the first complete, well-established system of diplomacy with resident ambassadors and all other forms of, of, of diplomacy. Uh, in the current international relations theory, it is considered to be a renaissance in Italy and the uh, exchange of ambassadors in the 15th uh, century. We will return to Amarna diplomacy later, later on. The next period uh, is uh, still in the second century BC is Hittite diplomacy. And uh, as you can see here is a border between uh, Hittite empire, which was uh, predominant in the Southern Turkey, now the Syria and Egypt. And it is well known for the first international treaty 
a Treaty of Kadesh, which was uh, co uh, concluded by the Ramses the Fourth and Hittite, uh, Hittite uh, king. I cannot recall his name. That is uh, with the ancient name. And you can see it's, it, it is preserved. It's not in the in the best shape. But uh, I'm wondering what uh, people will uh, find out of our uh, chart of the UN in the well, in the next four or five millenniums, and they will be looking at our time. At least we have some sort of physical uh, evidence of the of the first uh, treaty. Luca is asking me something in Italian. Luca, uh, you are. Uh, or estimating my linguistic skills. Okay, then the next period is uh, Syrian, uh, I'm sorry, Syrian diplomacy, uh, built then mainly the, around the Sargonid uh, library. Again, in the southern Turkey, now the Syria, you can uh, see the famous brand, if you can call it, this was probably Nike of the time of the Assyrian, Assyrian era, 8th century BC. It is this flying flying bull. You can find it. Uh, find it. No, it's fine, Luca. Uh, you can find it uh, in uh, in books, and uh, it's probably the most recognizable uh, recognizable uh, icon of the Assyrian Assyrian period. Again, uh, there was a quite uh, quite extensive and well developed uh, system of uh, diplomacy, uh, and. Uh, we have some sort of elements of the early uh, cipher protection uh, system um, quite developed in Assyrian diplomacy, although you can find uh, uh, examples of the code uh, breakers and code protection of the com uh, communication, even in the, in the Sumerian uh, communication. And I will send you a link to this excellent book, The Code Breakers, which basically uh, is tracing uh, the history of the code breaking from the Sumerian period and focusing especially over the uh, Assyrian uh, code protection till uh, till uh, today, till, till Enigma and, uh, and other, other systems. Now, uh, in this quick, it's really quick, surfing over to almost 4,000 years, we come to the Persian diplomacy and the famous uh, Cyrus cylinder which uh, uh, Cyrus, the ruler of the Persia, the most successful ruler of the Persia, uh, created, I can hear well, okay. That's a good point, Stefano, action checker. Great. Uh, which he basically developed uh, when he conquered Babylon and uh, he granted uh, the um, freedom of uh, uh, religion, freedom of expression, if you can call it in nowadays term, to the conquered uh, people of, uh, of Babylon. And I will send you a very interesting uh, link, uh, uh, link to the article uh, written by Cohen, uh, uh, Richard Cohen, the journalist uh, of, uh, he writes for the International Herald Tribune. Uh, now the Cyrus cylinder is used quite a lot for confidence building. Uh, it will be moved from the British Museum in London to the United States in order to try to build the parallel links and to increase, uh, improve uh, very, very bad relations currently on the level also perception between Iran and the United States. And it is uh, well known, it's, uh, it's uh, almost icon in, the, in the Persia, it's important uh, relic of the ancient time uh, showing high level of sophistication of the organization of society. What we did, we, we served through this period. We started with um, just uh, go quickly. To, uh, we started with with the uh, indication about Sumeria, moved to Babylon, Amarna diplomacy, Amenhotep, well developed diplomatic relation, Hittite, well known for the first uh, international treaty, Treaty of Kadesh. Assyria, the highlight is quite developed cipher protection in the first half, as uh, Stefano indicated, and closing it with the Persia. And uh, the moment when the, the Darius, as uh, you can recall from the background text, offered for the first time to sign the treaty or to sign to have agreement with Alexander the Great, but it was too late. One of the well known uh, elements uh, in the Persian history was that they didn't use diplomacy at all. Well. They believed in power, in might, and uh, he, Darius, tried it at the, the last last days of the Persian Empire. 
and uh, with the conquer from the Alexander the Great, we moved to the period of the ancient and ancient Greece, later on ancient Rome, and we will serve to the history of civilization, the way how the policy was used in this period. Now, what the question what which we can ask is, uh, what can we learn from this 5,000 uh, years of the history of the ancient Near East? Is there any lesson for uh, for our time? I think that the first lesson is general that we can reconfirm that the initial uh, importance of interplay of continuity and change, like today. Uh, people in Samaria, in the Amarna, in Kitais, they're basically uh, trying to arrange uh, relations between different uh, kingdoms, on be di between different rulers. Sometimes people, people are referring to the state, but I would, wouldn't go that far that state as a state understood. Uh, in, a modern, uh, uh, in our modern time, I think it didn't exist at that time, but there were rulers and there were negotiators. So that was underlying the development uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the history. And obviously tools have been changing, as you notice, writing was introduced, exchange of diplomatic notes, diplomatic archives and other, and other. Now, what we can learn, there are a few lessons that we can uh, learn and probably keep in mind while we are moving, as you can see in this cartoon, from the first written world in Sumeria to Gutenberg, mass publication at the beginning of 20th century, email and uh, Twitter, Twitter today. This is the centrality of writing for diplomacy. And uh, as you, as the famous Latin uh, saying uh, says that uh, what, uh, what is said flies and uh, what is written remains for the posterity, we can see that uh, that element and interplay between, as you will see, oral and written is, was, is, and will be the key for, uh, for diplomacy. Therefore, I'm sure that our uh, colleagues at the Italian Diplomatic Academy and all of you are aware of the importance of the writing and the drafting and all aspects of the use of the, of the text of diplomacy. It is the key uh, diplomatic technology. Here we can see uh, quite a few paradoxical developments. Uh, I would say that most of you were young and uh, didn't follow the developments that closely. For example, in the 1990s, Stefano and I, we were around. And I can recall that at that time, all predictions were that we will use uh, video technology with the development of uh, internet and the ICT computers. Therefore, there was a quotation, the more computers, the more IT, the more video technology, less text. And we had, in a way, unexpected development that uh, SMS became one of the uh, one of the key medium for communication on the mobile, Twitter later on, even the short text with 140 of the characters. Therefore, technology can give us unexpected developments as we can see with, uh, with writing. Underlying message, writing is the key diplomatic technology. Second element, which I'm a bit concerned that we have been underestimating in our time is uh, that uh, we are in a way uh, quite relaxed about uh, preserving knowledge and information of our, our time. And I already mentioned that I've been highlighting it is that we have to ask ourselves what will be discovered from our civilization, let's say two, 2,000 years as uh, we can compare with uh, 1,800, uh, so uh, 3,700 years compared to Amarna civilization. I can see some discussion of the Twitter. I will join Maria and Luca shortly. Therefore, preserving of the memory, institutional memory of ministries of foreign affairs is extremely important. And if you trace the history of diplomacy, the first archive, one of the reasons why permanent mission was established between Milan and Genoa, was to have the archive within embassy with the documentation. Later on, ministry of foreign affairs in the time of Richelieu in France, uh, 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 was developed around archives, which was the first department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Preserving memory uh, is, was, was extremely, extremely important. Now, therefore, the first lesson is the importance of writing, importance of archive, and the third is interplay of oral and written communication. I uh, 
could put my back that this will be probably one of the main challenges of modern diplomacy, because we are now pulled in all directions, whether it is email or Twitter or, or whatever else, written communication, and in the same time, oral communication, as this drawing shows from our calendar, remains extremely, extremely, extremely important. Therefore, that interplay, and I'm seeing it in Geneva, uh, I'm based in Geneva, this is broadcasting from the road, road of Lausanne in Geneva, Quite a few colleagues, diplomats based in Geneva, spend more and more time uh, in their offices. And one of the arguments is, if you are based in Geneva, you should be interacting with your colleague diplomat. You should communicate, you should speak, negotiate, not uh, sit in your office or sit behind your computer in the conference room, which is happening, happening very often. Therefore, people are physically there, their bodies to be count behind the plates of their countries, but they are basically virtually somewhere else. Therefore, that, that's another side information, side the comment that we'll discuss later on is importance of, in, uh, of introduction of Wi-Fi and internet in the conference room, with positive and negative uh, development. Therefore, this is the uh, third uh, important uh, lesson that we'll have to keep in mind and that we'll have to focus more and more in the future. I will close my presentation, I'm only uh, half an hour, on the um, one uh, useful advice that we can receive from the ancient era to our age of innovation. As you can, as you know, the key word of our uh, era is innovation. And it is uh, uh, found uh, uh, in the writing, Plato's writing, where he put, as, as Plato did with most of his writing, this conversation in the mouth of the Socrates. Uh, Socrates was, uh, uh, Socrates was uh, as you know, uh, he didn't write, he didn't uh, leave behind him any written record, and he was very skeptical about writing. Therefore, this conversation, I can find it uh, relevant for our time, and probably it will remain relevant for the, for the future, as uh, many of the writings of the both Plato and thinking of uh, Socrates. Basically, the Theus, who is on the left-hand side, is God of invention, is coming uh, to King uh, Thamus to convince him uh, about extreme usefulness of the writing for memory and wisdom. And he probably did some sort of early PowerPoint presentation and he tried to press persuade King Tamu, probably looking for some funding. Currently I'm in fundraising uh, phase, I can tell you, it's not easy. He used all, all of his arguments, uh, King Tamu followed uh, his, uh, his presentation and then um, uh, he answered in the following way. I'll just read the text, but you can find it in the background document. Uh, he replied, the discoverer of an art is not the best judge of the good or harm which will accrue to those who practice it. He tells it now to tell, out of the fondness for your offspring writing, you have attributed to this invention of writing quite the opposite of its real function. He continues, those who acquire it will cease to exercise their memory and become forgetful. They will rely on writing to bring things to their remembrance by external signs instead of their own internal resources. Keep in mind, Socrates is very skeptical about, about writing. King Thomas continues, when you have discovered is a recipe for recollection, not for memory. And as for wisdom, your pupils will have the reputation for it without the reality. They will receive a quantity of information without proper instruction. And in consequence, be taught very knowledgeable when they are for the most part quite ignorant. And because they are filled with the conceit of wisdom, instead of real wisdom, they will be a burden to society. Now, uh, if you just replace writing with uh, access to the Google, Google search, uh, you can find similar debate uh, today between uh, nowadays modern Celts, the gods of innovation, invention, and uh, those who are more, more skeptical. Now, what we can learn from this dialogue uh, recorded uh, almost no, 23 centuries ago in the ancient Greece, is that this discussion is ongoing 
and uh, you, most of our uh, Italian friends, the junior diplomats, will be uh, finding and will be participating in this debate throughout your career, as we did in the past, as we will do, will do in the future. That tension between invention, innovation, and uh, and uh, integration to society, sometimes conservatism, sometimes justified uh, skepticism will will remain underlying uh, question for the interplay between technology and economy. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention. It seems that the technology worked quite well this time. Therefore, at least we have uh, this breakthrough. As, uh, as uh, King Thomas would be very, very pleased with me, I uh, gave up of uh, using too many videos today. And I, in a way, betrayed the Teut uh, God, of, uh, God of invention and uh, I wasn't technology driven today. Now I will try to go quickly through your chat and I'm, I'm waiting for your comments and, uh, and questions, if you have any, uh, related mainly to this question, what we can learn from um, ancient time and what we can apply for our time and for the future. Now, uh, important lesson from B, Maria. Maria is a skeptic about Twitter, uh, or Luca as well. Uh, Nico, quite quite a, a, a Twitter skeptic uh, club uh, we have here. Uh, Milo, uh, Milutin is a pretty awkward man. Milutin is not correct. Uh, was uh, but that's two years ago. Okay, Stefano, uh, yes, that's that's important to highlight it's a choice. Uh, Mariella, I suggest that you read uh, uh, one book which was recently co-published by by uh, uh, Parnesina and Diplo on uh, Twitter diplomacy. Lutin, you uh, for your own purposes, you're too old. Fine, the, the trouble of the media often are not, in fact, ours. It's a good point, D. To what extent we can control it, but we'll come to that uh, message later on. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, being silent on Twitter doesn't mean to be dead. It can be such a useful source of info without directly causing it to yourself. Good point. I think that uh, the uh, Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs highlighted it in his introduction as important source of information and information gathering is one of the key diplomatic functions from the ancient time to today. Uh, Milutin, ah, well, that should be invented. Uh, then uh, Lutin use it to gather info as well as to send info in a much more targeted way. Good point. Maria totally agreed with uh, the doctor. Uh, okay. Uh, Gala, I also agree with Elizabeth. Okay, you agree, Gala, that information gathering is important. This is also how it's used to use Twitter. And we look and we can learn that change is constant and then some take it easy and some don't. I have to, uh, to inform the rest of the group that uh, Milutin is a uh, uh, specialist for the change management. He was introducing changes in. Uh, World Scout Org Organization. It, it did make him particularly popular, uh, firstly because the changes in the big system are uh, uh, not not uh, not highly appreciated. Uh, Stefano, that's a good point. On the 8th of March, uh, we'll have to organize something on the for the ladies participants as well. There will be Twitter focusing on the for uh, uh, session on Twitter for diplomats. Nico, then we'll have to learn with Stefano that. Good. Uh, you should try, Nico. You should experiment. You should be. Uh, you should use your judgment. Uh, and it's important that you make informed decisions. That that's the key point. That you learn what works, what doesn't work, and uh, and you make informed decisions. Stefan, I am very interested in trying to understand why there is so little attention to the issue of electronic archives. Good point, Stefan. There is a, some sort of. Uh, it's called in arc. Uh, arc archive circle black hole in archives which exists somewhere between 1998 to 2002. It was the moment when many uh, institutions started uh, introducing word processing at that time word per perfect word for windows and uh, in that four years uh, there was a very little uh, documentation in archives. Later on as you know there are now more serious ways to, 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 uh, to save the Archives. But when you 
we don't uh, we couldn't find it in uh, Amarna, but we can find it in archives from the let's say 17th, 18th century. What is missing nowadays is the whole saving of the process of developing documents. When I joined the uh, Yugoslav diplomacy in the 90s, I remember that uh, I, as a um, youngest uh, junior diplomat, had to draft the documents that went to the uh, superior. He made the comments and uh, returned it uh, in quite depressing way for me. But all thread of the not verbal or the draft of the report was kept in the archive. And we are losing it today. That's an extremely valid question, Stefan. And I don't know how we can we can preserve that rich uh, source of information. Nico, time is my or uh, welcome to the club. And uh, um, I can uh, I suppose uh, Nico that you also could uh, become a, a part of my club of the uh, procrastination that usually comes together lack of time and procrastination. Gala, uh, Stefan, we have to talk about that. I'm trying to explore these questions for our historical archives. Excellent, excellent that that uh, you you should uh, uh, be alert about this. Indeed, there is also a serious problem with obsolescence. That's a good point. Good, even web newspapers since uh, they are they gradually are not archived properly. Good, good point. There is archive uh, web service where you can find some sort of a old website. I found Diplo's website from the 1998. I was quite impressed how good website it was. I will send you a link and you can go to the archive or you can Google it. The, that's correct. Great uh, uh, tablet that arrived. What do you think about digital ones? So that's paper. Paper with, uh, with, uh, with less success, um, but we have still some especially parchments and uh, minute in archive memory will be one of the key problems of mankind, both personal and collective. We tend to store more and more, and it is simpler and cheaper to keep now electronic archives. Therefore, you, Minuti, you argue that we store more and more, not that we, we don't store, or we store more and more, but there is no sort of hierarchy or priority in storing. I can tell you I had recently found a few diskettes and I could open the files because they were used prepared by using the word perfect in 1995, 1996. Yeah, floppy disk. Yeah, well, I, I, in a way, give the answer how difficult for me. I have now to bring it to the specialized company and to pay quite a lot in Switzerland in order to, to retrieve the files. Uh, Gala, yes, the problem of survival is fundamental. This is what our expert archivists are scared of. A routine. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't, and uh, and it made me it made me think about uh, about this question. And uh, I discovered this uh, floppy, the big ones, not even the small ones. Those uh, those early floppies of I think five inch or something like this. I found this while I was preparing uh, preparing this presentation. I thought, my God, this we have all this uh, information about Am Amarna and what is going to 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 remain after after. Uh, yes, Minuti, my wife is champion of throwing. We are now getting here into gender arguments. I try to keep as much as possible and have not enough space. The same is with organization. The same thing is at, at my place. My wife is also uh, more rational and she's trying to throw away things. Luca, true, we do not use floppies, but paper archives are also useless. We have no time to go and retrieve info there. Good point. Digital provides that convenience of retrieving information. It's so much available, how to decide what to say? One million dollars question. Be any any help from our audience? How do you decide what to say? Andre, good point. I never thought of it of qualitative storage. That's a very good point. Because we have now quantitative storage. I, at least myself, I save everything because uh, it's uh, available, it's free. And it gives me some sort of a uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, easiness that it is safe somewhere. I don't have to make decisions. This is another, when I mentioned in the comment to Luca, the question of procrastination. We are great procrastinators because we don't, we postpone our decisions. What to say, what to delete. 
Giorgio, uh, the safety and security of the is, uh, archives is also a problem to be addressed. Giorgio, I'm sure that you can, you're referring to the, at least we can refer to the question of the WikiLeaks as one of the best examples of how archive is diplomacy, in diplomacy was, uh, was misused. Uh, Milutin, no, not at all. This is the issue of prioritizing. That is one of the key things, skills when working on archiving. Uh, D, if writing a killed memory, perhaps this uh, technology killed the ability to choose. Never thought of it. D, I'm, I'm inviting you to prepare the next blog post on the, this parallel for, the, for, the, for our uh, diplo space. It's, it's a very good point because we are less forced to choose. Although another underlying uh, theme of our civilization is the possibility uh, to choose, but it's a good question. What are the limits and can we choose or are we allowed not to choose because any choice involves uh, some sort of tension, friction and, uh, and possible, uh, possible uh, difficult consequences. We, we are free to choose, but we are not free to, to, de uh, to decide uh, if we want to accept consequences of our choices. Giorgio, well, that's a good point. Uh, you know that in the history of civilization, there were a few points when the magnetic plus and minus switched off and in some theories even disappeared so dinosaurs, dinosaurs together with ice age and meteorite um, drift in Russia. Uh, uh, they ascribe that uh, the, the switch between positive and negative uh, magnetic poles between north and the south uh, happened a few times in history. If it happens nowadays, basically whole uh, electronic, uh, whole digital world will be affected because it is uh, uh, all of our memory is in magnetic uh, magnetic fields, uh, very minute magnetic fields, but we cannot shield it from the general magnetic field that exists uh, uh, in the world. And it's, it's probably, uh, some of you I'm sure, since you joined the ministry are good writers, it could be an interesting novel or at least blog thinking what can happen if uh, there is a switch of the poles happening in our era. Good, D. You suggested, D, to write a blog or uh, about this question of choice. Luca, you can have backup of electronic half a very, very thick paper. I would get lost. You cannot retrieve anything. Yeah, to this point, connected with archive from the opposite side, we search and how to find the interesting information, especially if there is so many available. Uh, again, difficult, difficult. Google, uh, saying Google is, is, is around to help us with all uh, advantages and disadvantages. Luca, uh, it is, it is uh, it, I have to admit, I try to find something in a, in a few archives and it's not, it's not easy. But what I really like, in every archive you have some historians who are studying and they're so nice and so uh, enthusiastic that they're looking for somebody whom they can help. At least I, when I was looking for uh, some information, for example, in the archive of Yugoslavia, there was a famous, famous document, uh, uh, just, just an anecdote. When the Austria-Hungarian Empire issued the ultimatum to Serbia after the assassination of the Duke Ferdinand in Sarajevo, they send a letter and they told them that they expect in this Austrians wrote, Austria Hungarian Empire wrote that in this time and age of the fast technology, we expect expect answer in 48 hours. And the answer of the of the Serbian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was half typed on the typewriting machine, which uh, we, uh, which broke at the middle of the of the writing of the the answer, and the half was written in the handwriting. That it, quite historical, not verbal, it, when basically Serbia refused ultimatum, Austro-Hungarian ultimatum. And I was looking for that document. It took me about, about two days to find it. But in the process, I discovered so many lovely people in the archive, and it's so fun. Luca, uh, carbon paper brings me back to the past. Yeah, great memories. D, I agree. I agree. There is also also the optimism of the memory D, which is sometimes risky, especially when we are uh, we are getting older. But uh, we we should be realistic about. We shouldn't 
use the simplistic uh, idea that the time passage brings modernity and progress inevitably. I think that line is not straight. Stefano, Milutin, one of the main differences with the past, even applicable to diplomacy, is that in the past only few had access to a relative little information. Today, many have access to excessive information. That's a good point. And Stefano, Stefano is, is, uh, is uh, trying to zoom out and to put things into perspective. And that's through access to information, openness, with all positive and negative aspects, is uh, one of the major developments. Luca, the problem is that we are supposed to retrieve the info quickly and we have no time to browse paper archives. That's it. I don't argue for, uh, for uh, suggest that we go through paper archives, but if you happen to be granted sabbatical, I don't know if the Italian diplomatic service like <clears throat> Mexican grants sabbaticals once in the career, try to spend a few days in archive and it will be fun. Milutin agrees, Stefano, more and more is shared and available now. For some, it is good. For some, maybe not. The, uh, those few have been taught to understand, the many may know, but do they understand? That's, that's a good point. Uh, like in uh, the discussion between uh, 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 two Egyptian, the god of innovator and the king, is, is the question what we can process, even if we have access to information. Are we equipped to, to, to process and to reflect, to use it properly? Good, thank you for, for this really interesting, interesting discussion. I will summarize the main points, but they are more or less along the lines that uh, we anticipated uh, around the question of archives, finding information uh, and uh, <clears throat> surviving in the, in the internet era by using some sort of recipes from the past, especially uh, some suggestions like as one given by Plato on discussion between Theos and Smoke and Samuel. Now with this, I would, I would like to, to close the webinar and to uh, alert you that you will receive a few questions that will be part of the completion of this, we call it advanced diplomatic webinar or small course. Therefore you will, uh, based on this discussion, you will have to answer a few questions and you will receive the certificate for the successful completion of the webinar. That will uh, happen in the next, next few days. And with, uh, with that uh, announcement, okay, Massimo is uh, with the third and the yeah, that's, that's, that's another, another. Let me just make the digression with, uh, with uh, Massimo's point. It's just, just uh, I don't know if you had a chance to type, to use typewriter with carbon copy. Uh, I did it. I use it uh, a lot. When I used to type on typewriter, I had to be very concentrated in order to have the finality of my thought because the possibility of changing the text was very, very limited. Then we had to concentrate. We had to choose the right word. We were not, we were in a way forced to do it uh, while, while we were typing. Nowadays, we are much more relaxed. And what we mentioned, uh, this question of no choice and procrastination is affecting, like writing in the ancient, ancient Egypt, is affecting the way we are thinking because we are much more relaxed, less focused, and becoming a greater procrastinator. Thank you. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed a lot, a lot your, your, your questions and comments. And next uh, month, on the fourth Friday of March, we will move to ancient Greece. These issues, uh, protagonists and questions and will be more familiar uh, to, uh, for you. Then we will uh, in April uh, have the session on the ancient Rome and you will be at home then. You can go and visit a few places that we'll uh, be mentioning in, in discussion. I hope that uh, you found this anchoring into the history useful and it may inspire you to think about uh, use of the internet or to visit archive Luca if you if you get uh, some free time and uh, and move on with uh, uh, with the uh, discovering of the e-diplomacy by keeping uh, full awareness of what happened uh, before us. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye bye.